Multi-threaded programming can be challenging and error prone. Rust has some utilities for us to take advantage of to make this easier for us. My name is Ricky and welcome to the dev method. So what's cool about Rust and concurrent programming is that they use this uh, concept of threads and you can fix some of your concurrent code before you even run it. This take on concurrent programming is known as fearless concurrency. Before we jump to the code, let's review threads. So when you have two or more threads running at the same time, they're all sharing the same bit of memory and then they're running in parallel. And traditionally in programming, this comes with some inherent difficulties or challenges. First one, there could be race conditions. That's where you can read and write a piece of memory or try and access a piece of memory both at the same time and you get inconsistent results or not exactly what you expected. And then there's deadlocks and that's when two threads are trying to wait for each other to continue their process or continue their next line of code. And then defects are hard to reproduce and might take many, many cycles for you to figure out what actually is going on and why it's breaking. So let's create a new thread with spawn. So here, starting on line four is the main function and we're running till uh, line 16 there. Lines five through 10, this is where we actually create that new thread and then we're just doing some sort of computation or some sort of work there. And then lines 12 through 15, that's also doing some work too. So if you take a look at it, the part that's really similar here is that there's uh, four loops going on. So the for loop in the thread is actually printing out something about the thread being spawned. And then it's sleeping for just a certain number of milliseconds. So we're just going with a really small, really, really, really small millisecond here. And it takes a thousand milliseconds to equal a second. And then on line 14, we're doing that same thing, but these are running in two separate threads. So we don't have any example right now where they're sharing memory. We're just running two different sets of instructions in parallel. Now let's actually run this and talk through it. All right, so I do cargo run. All right, so let's look at our output here. So we have the main thread that actually prints first, and then we have the spawn thread, then the main thread, then the spawn thread. So um, you can see here, that you might think that the spawn thread should print first, but it actually turns out that the main thread did. So what's happening here is that as soon as there's that split, uh, both instructions are gonna be running simultaneously. And then just depending on your operating system and depending on that processor, it's gonna be running a certain set of instructions all concurrently at the same time, but you don't necessarily see those print statements running on top of each other. They will be one after another. So the problem here is that uh, as soon as the main function ends, so as soon as we get to that line 16, it doesn't matter how many iterations we are through the loop within the thread, we'll actually see that all of the threads that have been spawned will automatically be shut down. Another thing to point out is that we can't even guarantee that the thread will even run in the first place. We could have just printed something and then ended out the, uh, the main function and not even gone through more iterations of a loop and it could have just never even printed anything on the thread. So then let's add something here that will help us wait for all the threads to finish, and then we'll actually execute what's on the main thread. So the uh, spawn here is actually returning some sort of handle. So I have that pulled up here in the documentation. It says join handle. So let's not worry so much about the type, but we'll just assign this to a variable called handle. And then on line 12, we do handle.join. And then that dot join is actually returning a result. Um, so in this case, we're just gonna force it to unwrap. And for our purposes, we don't need to really be doing error checking, but in this case, uh, we're gonna run up until line 12 and it's gonna finish executing that thread. And then it's gonna print the remainder of the instruction in the main thread. So let's run this example and see what happens. All right, so cargo run. All right, so um, it did all the spawning and the running of that code within the thread, and then it ran through the main thread. So if you recall from a couple videos ago when we talked about closures, we talked about this concept, uh, this keyword called move, where um, we take ownership of the values inside the closure. So here in this example, um, we have something, uh, a vector, calling it V, just has a couple numbers, and then we wanna just print it out, but print it out on a different thread. And we are gonna force main to wait around for that thread to finish, and that's what we're doing on line 13. Now, the difference here is that we wanna move some of these values or this variable V into the closure. So that closure is starting on nine, so we can do stuff with that data. 
So something that Rust actually can't tell us is actually how long something like this is going to take place and then when we're going to wait for it to be cleaned up or finished. So let's run this and look at the full error output. So we got cargo run. Yep, and here we have the error. So it's saying um, where we're spawning that thread. It says uh, to force the closure to take ownership of V, you have to use move. So that's where it's telling us to use move here. So let's just take a look and see how that helps us. All right, so we have uh, move right here on line nine, right before the closure. And so that's telling Rust that we're taking ownership of V inside that closure. So then we can do stuff to that inside that thread. Let's run this and check it out. All right, there it is. One, two, and three inside that vector. And that's printed from within the thread. So now you might be thinking, what if uh, we wanted to uh, explicitly tell Rust that we're not using that value anymore and we explicitly drop it. So if we look at V and we tell it to drop on line 12, so the ownership rules really help here because it's saying that V actually already moved into that thread um, with that move closure here. Um, so that's why it's saying we can't use it after it's already been moved. Now I'm going to run this. So cargo run. All right, so there it is nice and red, just like before. But then it's kind of giving us more output here, saying, here it is, and then we moved it. So this is just your intro to spawning a thread in Rust. If you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Uh, I'll do my best to answer them. And if you guys like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this or send it to a friend. Otherwise, have a good one.